Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Long, and I'm the Chair and Dean of the University Libraries, Archives, and Museums. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's webinar on the Academic Film Archive of North America, which through the generosity of its founder, Jeff Alexander, is now housed at Johns Hopkins University's Sheridan Libraries. I'm especially excited by tonight's program because the move of this collection from the West Coast was one of the first things I heard about when I started as Dean in January. The Sheridan Libraries are the indispensable hub of discovery, learning, and creativity at Hopkins. They provide a distinguished collection of information resources unbounded by place and preserved for future generations. We're absolutely delighted to have the Academic Film Archive among our world-class research collections and look forward to the exciting discoveries and scholarship the archive will surely generate. I'd like to thank the friends of the Johns Hopkins University Libraries for their sponsorship of tonight's program. There are many members of the Friends who are in the audience this evening, and I'd like to take a moment to recognize their generosity. The Friends provide financial support and advocacy for the Sheridan Libraries, and they sponsor events like the, this one that brings members of the campus and the wider community to the libraries to hear about how we do our work and the impact that it has. I would also like to thank our hosts in the Office of Alumni Relations, Lifelong Learning and Hopkins at Home, a digital platform for alumni and the public to experience Hopkins lectures like this one virtually. I now have the pleasure of introducing tonight's MC. Liz Mengel is the Associate Dean for Collections and Academic Services. She has been with the Sheridan Library for 22 years, serving in various roles since the beginning as a science and engineering librarian. Her current portfolio encompasses all aspects of the university's library collections, physical, digital, general, special books, and artworks. Liz is keenly interested in the future of large research intensive academic library collections. In addition to being the chief collections officer, she works with her teams to develop the services to make these collections discoverable and accessible and to preserve them for future use. Prior to joining Hopkins, Liz worked as Shell Oil Company in Houston, Texas. She received her undergraduate degree in art history from the University of Houston and her master's in library science from the University of North Texas. With that, I invite you to all get comfortable as I turn things over to Liz to start tonight's program for that introduction. And to all of you joining us tonight um, for our live webinar, I encourage you to ask questions through the Hopkins at Home Watch Now chat, and we'll address as many as we can as we get into the Q&A portion of our webinar. I have the great pleasure of introducing my fellow panelists. So first, um, Jeff Alexander. Jeff is the founder and director of the Academic Film Archive of North America, which he donated to Johns Hopkins in 2022. Jeff ran a successful Silicon Valley technology marketing company for 25 years and a Bangkok-based culture and tourism firm for 15 years. His other experience includes six years behind the mic on non-commercial radio, and teaching special education classes for the Santa Clara County Office of Education. In addition to several magazine and journal articles, he has written five books, primarily focusing on film, culture, and history. He holds a Master of Education, a Bachelor of Arts in Creative Arts, and attended the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Welcome, Jeff, and thank you from, for joining us from California. I am also very pleased to introduce uh, my colleague, Don Judas, who serves as the subject specialist and liaison librarian for the departments of Film and Media Studies, History of Art, and Near Eastern Studies in the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. In, his, in this capacity, Don collaborates with faculty members to build meaningful library collections in all formats. 
He also works closely with students to support their research, instructing them on strategies and tools pertinent to their fields of study. Now in his 25th year with the Sheridan Libraries, <laughs> Then previously was a humanities librarian at the University of Albany. He holds a master's in library science and a master's of arts and English from the State University of New York at Albany. Welcome, Don. So to start, um, I'd like to start off by sharing the mission of the Academic Film Archive, and then we'll watch a very brief video featuring 28 of the roughly 7,500 16 millimeter films from the collection. So the mission of the Academic Film Archive of North America is to acquire, preserve, document, and promote academic film by providing an archive, resource, and forum for continuing scholarly advancement and public exhibition. The archive defines academic film as any film in the broad subject areas of humanities and sciences, which were sold to secondary schools, universities, and public libraries. These films were made by educational film companies, television networks, nonprofit organizations, business entities, or other institutions making films with the intent to educate. The Academic Film Archive is the only institution in the United States dedicated to documenting the history of this important film genre. Now endangered by movement of many media libraries to divest their film collections. And I think many of us can remember those glorious days in school when it was film day and not lecture day. So before we watch the video, uh, and now we're gonna watch a video before we dive into our conversation. So hero, action. Bonjour. Good evening, I'm Roger Grimsby, here now the news. Different styles blended, producing new folk music. Waves like these are found where the wind has been blowing at high speeds in the same direction for a long time. Half the largest cities in America, this is the Midwest. Which is a ratio of about 1.04. Notice the exquisite craftsmanship. Come, let us explore these worlds, so different from our own. Great, that was wonderful. Um, I hope you enjoyed that little taste of the archive. So to start our conversation, I'm going to ask Jeff the $100 million question. How did you amass such an amazing film collection? And, and also, why did you select Hopkins to donate this collection to? First of all, Liz, I, I want to thank Renee Fisher for making that outstanding one-minute film. Uh, how anybody could make a one-minute non-narrated film describing the breadth of our archive, I would never have believed was possible, but Renee Fisher did it. So thank you, Renee. Uh, to answer your question, I began my experience with 16 millimeter film while teaching at the uh, Santa, Clara, Santa Clara County Office of Education in 1976. I used 16 millimeter film to, as an educational tool with my students focusing on social science documentary and science films, which really engaged my junior high school students. Fast forwarding to the 1990s, the County Office of Education decided that they were going to deaccession all of their films. They had about 9,000 items uh, in this really lovely 650 page catalog. I bought many of those films and started a private film collection. Uh, because I wanted to see them again. And I, in going through these films, showing them at my house, I wondered who made them. I found out nobody had ever done a history of the people who made these films or much of a history on the companies that made them. So there is this gap in scholarship when it came to these things. Uh, as I uh, showed more of these films at home, I decided we'd branch out. We went to downtown San Jose to an underground speakeasy. It was very bohemian. We encourage people to smoke, drink, and watch movies. And we began documenting these films, put them on the internet, did notes, 
And we were soon contacted by media librarians from all over the United States saying, hey, our films are being deaccessioned. They're going to go into landfill. Will you take them? Well, as a private entity, I couldn't, but as a 501c3 nonprofit, I could. So in 2001, we began the Academic Film Archive of North America as a nonprofit institution so we could take these films. Uh, incidentally, in terms of those underground shows we did, we did uh, 412 film shows comprising more than 1,500 films, and we put notes on the internet for all of them. And this is why we got so much juice. We also put together a website that was extensive so people could see what we're doing. And uh, of course, we use the term academic film to distinguish documentary social science and arts and sciences film from guidance films which are those hokey school bus safety films you all saw and have never been a big part of our collection and did not engage my students when I was teaching school. Uh, we use the term North America because we honor Canadian films. And so we broaden it out. Canada has a very rich film history. Many of the National Film Board of Canada uh, films were never distributed in the United States, but we managed to get some. Many of those are part of the GHU collection as well. Uh, so here we go. Now we're collecting films. Media archives from all over the United States are sending their films to us. Uh, these are regional archives. Many of the films in their collection were regional in nature. A number of them were made by local filmmakers, uh, uh, including Ray and Virginia Gardner, who made some wonderful films. Uh, we had a cellist in Boston who donated 650 music films, mostly rare from the 1930s up through the 1960s. So it became eventually 7,600 films. So in terms of what makes this collection unique, one of the most important and unique elements is that we've watched every single film in our collection. Not many archives can make that claim. There are 7,600 films we've watched. I've personally watched 7,400 of them. We've documented everything. We put them in our database, which you now have. Uh, and the website, of course, reflects all that scholarship as well. So that essentially is the story of how the archive was formed and what it became. Great. So um, could you maybe talk about what it, what it was about Hopkins that made you want to donate your film to us? Yeah, we had a very successful run in San Jose of 20 some odd years. Uh, why San Jose? Well, the Santa Clara County Office of Education wasn't just an anomaly. Back in the 1950s, San Jose State College was considered one of the leading schools in audiovisual education. Uh, our professors wrote books on AV. So naturally, the county uh, got all these incredible films and had this scholarship behind it. Well, after 20 years, History San Jose, which housed our collection, uh, could no longer afford the space. So we had to find a new home. So I really wanted to focus away from the Bay Area and from major uh, population areas that we thought were well served uh, in terms of film archives. So that said, no LA, no Bay Area, no New York, no Chicago. We're looking for a place underserved. And we're also looking for a place it's got an institution noted for its emphasis on superior scholarship, has an extensive library system, and a philosophy of public access. So Johns Hopkins University in the city of Baltimore met those criteria. And my initial discussions at JHU were with Adam Rogers, who runs the film studies program, uh, you, Liz, you, Don, uh, John Mann, and, and Dean Winston Tab. As it turns out, Dean Tab had hired my friend Greg Lukow to run the motion picture broadcasting and recorded sound division at the Library of Congress. So there was this affinity we had for film and for people we knew. Well, at that point, I flew to Baltimore meeting in person with Adam, John, Liz, and Don, among others. And I became convinced very quickly that JHU met all my objectives for finding a new home for the archive and for its historical ephemera. I think it was that that day that we spent driving around to the library services center and then taking you to the Peabody library that kind of sealed the deal. <laughs> it was, so, and you know what else it was, Liz? It was the enthusiasm of everyone I met at JHU. They were all so pumped about getting this archive and the enthusiasm was infectious. And it was it was very hard not to fall in love with the institution 
based based on the reception we got. Well, thank you. Um, that my next question is going to be for Don, um, but I I want you to Jeff to be thinking about what is it about sixteen millimeter film that would be interesting for you know an academic institution like ours, and I'll come back to you on that. But first, we'll head over to Don and ask. What impact will this collection have on film and media studies program, the libraries, and, and JHU as a whole? Thanks, Liz. And thanks, Jeff, for that wonderful um, input. You're right. We we fell in love with each other. It was a, it was a fantastic time, a, an exciting time for all of us. Uh, the excitement was real. Um, uh, I also, uh, today I'm speaking for myself, but I'm also speaking for Adam Rogers, the director of the Film and Media Studies program. Uh, he's very disappointed that he can't be here. There was a very last minute change in a, um, their hiring a new faculty member, and uh, there was a change to the interview process that he could not avoid. So he sends his regrets, uh, but uh, but as Jeff said, Adam is truly very, very excited about this, uh, this film archive coming uh, for coming to Hopkins. Um, and so as an as his academic liaison librarian, it's the job of the academic liaisons to represent the needs and thoughts of faculty and grad students and undergrads. So I think it's a natural fit for me to uh, talk about some of the input he gave me. Um, he's so excited about this because uh, our film and media studies program still teaches the production of 16 millimeter films, films made with that media, that it's an important uh, ped ped pedagogical um, component to uh, to their teaching. Um, and that more and more and more frequently, students coming into the program just think of film as you know what they see on their device, right? They don't realize that sometimes that film is actual physical medium a, 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 with tactility. Um, and so having a collection of this caliber here gives us so much more opportunity to give students um, uh, the ability to, to to use 16 millimeter film. Um, and he said, uh, and I, it's true, aesthetically, 16, fil 16 millimeter film looks different. It sounds different. It feels different. It has an aesthetic quality that is uh, is different from other film media. Uh, and then, of course, the historic significance of this particular collection, that it represents an era uh, when film became a primary medium to reach out to students to make sure that they had information that they needed to, to foster their growth and their, um, their education. So um, it's a very important from, from that perspective as well, the content itself. Um, and of course, uh, Jeff mentioned this very briefly, it, it also has lots of physical ephemera, printed things and canisters and uh, notes and all sorts of wonderful documentation uh, that goes with the film. Um, so there's a lot, a lot to this film uh, collection beyond the, seven, the 7,600 reels of film. Um, Adam also shared a really beautiful personal note that I want to share with you, uh, and I, I share, I, I agree with it. Um, he had, he remembered watching these films in, in classes growing up. I do too. Um, and that the, the big film day when the, the, the iconic AV cart was pushed into the classroom on a wobbly, wobbly stand, and you'd, you'd get the bell and howl 16 millimeter projector going, and there, the reels would be click, 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 click as, as you're going. Uh, there's a real, you know, there's something celebratory and wonderful about that kind of memory. Um, and he um, very quickly discovered that among the, of the 7,600 films, there are about 400 that are already digitized and available through the internet archive. Uh, and one he came across was one that he remembered distinctly as a child as being very, very um, important to him. It's something called The Hangman by Les Goldman. It was produced in the 60s um, and it was based on a, it was a, an animated short based on a poem uh, that reflects the concept of what happens when good people are faced with bad situations and they don't do anything. 
it's it's a very uh, important lesson to be learned. So um, he wanted me to share that with you. Um, to turn the tide a little bit for, from a library perspective, is sort of the, the other side of the coin, I think, um, is that uh, back to the point that I think Elizabeth made at the very beginning and, uh, and Liz reinforced, is that we build our research collections to support pedagogy, to support research and teaching. Uh, in any format. Um, we do already had a small 16 millimeter film collection, uh, but this is something that will really enhance that collection in a significant way. And it's important to us to have the media, uh, all the different types of media that our faculty need to do their teaching and their research. Um, and, um, and as we've already said, we are just thrilled to have this relationship with Jeff, that we are the new home for this wonderful archive. And I was thinking about it in terms of the, you know, right now we're sort of in our honeymoon period where we're just, but then I was thinking, it's really not the honeymoon period. It's before that. This is more like the engagement party. Um, we are, uh, we are, we we're celebrating what's going to happen um, and that we're starry eyed and thinking big, um, which means that we have a lot of work to do. Um, but a lot of a lot of my colleagues have already been working on this uh, diligently. For example, um, our university archivist Katie Carey and one of our great conservators, Alessandro Scola, went out to San Jose, met with Jeff, saw the inspected the collections and have made some assessments to um, figure out how we need to physically manage these things and make sure that they their integrity stays intact. That's for the films and for the related printed ephemera. Um, our in technical services, our metadata librarian, Michelle Janowicki, has worked diligently with Jeff uh, to 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 look at his extensive comprehensive database about this collection, all the different parts, and figure out a way to migrate uh, certain data into our library's online catalog so people can find it in our research tool, our central research tool at the library. Um, and actually just coincidental to all this, it's kind of funny, uh, a one of our staff members in Access Services, Holly Tomanak, uh, she recently just took a full inventory of our AV equipment that we have here in the building. And is to a perfect timing, uh, and she did a great job of doing that. Of course, the next step with regard to these things is to work with faculty like Adam Rogers and John Mann and other people in, in the program to make sure, for example, that our equipment works properly and won't damage the materials, uh, and also work with them because they have um, equipment in their program and figure out ways that we can address uh, when when people start asking to see these things and start start wanting to use these materials physically. Um, so that's something we're working on. Um, and again, in, in our starry eyed state. Um, and related to this, of course, is um, digitization. A lot of times people are looking to see the content of the film. They're not necessarily interested in um, the, the film as a medium per se, but they're interested in the in the historic content that is on the film itself. So uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, 400 of them have already been digitized into the internet archive, thanks to Jeff, and we will be working in the in the future to figure out how to digitize more of those things and how to go about what's the workflow, how are we going to do that, how are we going to identify uh, materials that can then go into a workflow uh, to be put into the internet, arch internet archive to join those, those 400. Um, so there's a lot of exciting planning for the future, um, but there was a lot of exciting things that just happened. So this is my segue back to Liz, because Liz has some a wonderful story, uh, how she had to work her magic to get this collection here. So, so Liz, what were the practical matters to get those materials from San Jose to Baltimore? Yeah, so as Elizabeth mentioned in her introduction to me, I have a very broad for portfolio at the library. Um, and for a large project like this, I like to think that I'm a bit of the magic behind the scenes, um, not often seen, but, uh, you know, we're working some magic, you know, other people may say other things, but I like to think of myself as magic. Um, so Don mentioned for, for us, um, 
one of the first things we do when we look at a collection is how does it fit into our collection policy and strategy? It really must support research and teaching for us to expend our energy and funds on bringing a collection in. So this collection certainly did that. Um, for this collection, after meeting uh, with Jeff and showing him around JHU, my first step then is to alert our dean and our development office that we are considering this because they are key players in the next steps that are going to happen. I also immediately sent Jeff a sample of our deed of gift form so that any kind of negotiating could be done on that deed of gift. Those are incredibly important um, um, things for us to have because we wanna protect ourselves and the donor um, in terms of the future and what we are able to do with these kind of collections. Um, then, as Don mentioned, I sent out our university archivist, Katie Carey, and on our conservator, Alessandra Scola, out to San Jose to do an assessment of the collection. Um, I, I will admit I was a little worried because I didn't know if I'd have to, you know, kind of bail them out of jail after they were meeting with Jeff, but we saw the pictures of them going out to dinner and having all kinds of fun, but you know, we have the purchasing card to, to, to take care of those things. Um, Katie also brought back uh, Jeff's incredible database for us to start doing some early research on and to start thinking about how would we transfer these records into our online catalog because that they're they're a little bit different, the fields, but as Don mentioned, Michelle Janowicki did an amazing job of being able to translate that, moving it through different um, formats to be able to do that. So once the decision was made that the collection was coming here, the deed of gift was signed, um, then all kinds of other details need to get mapped out. Everything from hiring a company that will pack and move the collection, how will we make the collection, to figuring out how we'll make the collection discoverable. How are we gonna service it once it gets here? Where are we gonna put it? How are we going to get it there? How are we going to preserve the question long term? Because for an academic library like, like we are, preservation for the long term is really key for what we, what we want to do. We want these not just for right now, but for the, for the future. Um, when do we move the collection? At the time, we were waiting for the, the finishing of our, our second bay out at our library services center. So I couldn't move it until after that bay was built. So there is a lot of timing that had to get done. Um, then how do we use Jeff's database to make our, our uh, these records accessible and discoverable? So, and then in addition to figuring out some of those details, we have to work with our risk management group to account for the collection's value, which then meant hiring an appraiser to come in and do an appraisal of the collection. Um, there's also significant publicity for the collection and to our various constituents. And so um, Heather Stalford, who is our communications director, worked closely with Jeff and the film and media studies to be able to have the appropriate press releases and uh, social media platforms updated. So a lot of magic happening in the background. There's a couple of fun things that I learned with this collection. So one of them was in all my years as a librarian and the you know collections i had never bought a freezer before so um we had to buy a freezer for some of the films that were starting to go a little vinegary um and putting them in a freezer helps us uh, to keep them stable so um, film and media studies found some money and i got to choose this beautiful uh French door freezer that we now have out at our library services center. And it is, you know, the, the film and media studies freezer at the LSC is its official name. So the other thing we learned is our conservators were very concerned about the movement of the film from San Jose to Baltimore in terms of putting this in a truck that may be hot. Um, and the temperature, things would be too hot in there. We were a little concerned that the emulsion might come off the, the film. Um, and so one of the things I learned is that to hire a 53 foot refrigerated truck to move 7,600 films 
from San Jose to Baltimore, it would cost $100,000. Now, I think after that meeting, uh, Jeff and I talked offline and we were like, well, no, we are not paying $100,000 to move that collection. So um, one of the things I did was I, I looked at um, weather maps to see when the weather in San Jose and when the weather in Baltimore and at various points across the country were within maybe five to 10 degrees of each other. And those would be our target dates to move the collection. So that was that was not something I normally do when I'm moving a collection, but that was something we learned to do when we were moving this one. And there's actually, it was a kind of two or three week uh, window um, where we could do this, both based on timing of when our service new service center bay opened, when the weather was good, and when we actually signed all the appropriate documents to hire the people and, and get the truck. And we had gone back and forth about one truck, two trucks, one driver, two drivers, how can we get it here fast enough? So it was one truck, two drivers. All, all the planning you do sometimes though, doesn't mean that things are gonna go perfect. Um, we had had a plan for when the collection was going to come in. Unfortunately, there was an early ice storm in the Midwest that kind of slowed the trucks down. Um, we had had a whole bunch of people go out to the service center to greet the collection as it came in. And they got there and they waited and they waited because the, the trucks were still stuck in Illinois or Indiana or someplace where it was icing. Um, the collection arrived the next day, but to much less fanfare, and no one was out there taking pictures of it. But, you know, the best intentions were there to be to be there with bells on to bring in the collection. Today, our work continues to adjust the collection into our into the library management system. One of the things it was like I think halfway through the process, it really dawned on me that every single can had to have a barcode for for um, getting into our um, service center so that we could find it again. The films had barcodes on and we thought, oh, we could use those, reuse those barcodes, but it didn't match our system. So everything now has to be rebarcoded and put in. But um, we'll get there. Um, you know, sometimes it's like you eat an elephant, you know, one bite at a time is, is how I say. So from our first meeting with Jeff on Monday, April 25th, 2022, to the delivery of the film on Monday, November 14th, 2022, I will say this has been one of the, um, the highlights of my career bringing, bringing this in. This has been just a great adventure. And I am so incredibly proud of all of our team here at the libraries film and media study, and Jeff's team in San Jose in how everyone came together to bring this in. So now my final question for Jeff is, let's see here. What, Jeff, what do you hope for the, the outcomes for that you want to see for this collection at Hopkins? Well, there are too many to name, Liz. I, I've got three major ones. But uh, I'm going to backtrack a little bit to address a question you had earlier. Why 16 millimeter? Why is this an important okay. medium? I can I can bring that back to something Don said about that movie Hangman. Hangman was a uh, 10 minute short that was made, uh, I believe, in the mid 1950s. We have that on 16 millimeter. Uh, the producer's son was in touch with us saying he didn't have a copy of the film. Well, we did. We digitized it. We worked on the color a little bit, and we were able to produce it out of a 16 millimeter version. Uh, you can't do this if 16 millimeter films aren't around anymore. And uh, they tried to kill 16 millimeter film by coming out with VHS tapes. Resolution's horrible. Uh, essentially, in many cases, the original film elements that were turned into 16 millimeter films are no longer around or not accessible. So this medium itself is a historical medium. Uh, something like 70% of all silent films have been thrown away. So we've lost a huge part of the silent film business. Uh, we don't want that to happen with 16 millimeter. Uh, there are cases where in the case of documentary films, for instance, uh, that were made by the networks, they either don't have their original elements 
or it's impossible to get into their archives. The only way you can see their documentary films is through going through an archive such as ours and watching them on 16 millimeter. Uh, in addition to that, they're eminently uh, digitizable. Now, the digitization process, as we know it today, works with 2D scans. Essentially, they scan, scan corner to corner, and you get a digitized film. But there's a new technology emerging. It's 3D scans, and it scans through layers of emulsion in film. Uh, this is going to revolutionize digitization. It's so expensive now, very few people can afford it. But this is the future. If you don't have 16 millimeter film, you ain't got emulsions, okay? That's why this medium is so important. So what, what do we see in terms of our hopes for JHU? Well, okay, from an undergrad perspective, students are gonna be using these as resources for films they're going to make. They can use them in their own productions. They can write term papers on the elements in the collections by utilizing the films of the database and the AFA website as starting points. So there's a lot of scholarship for undergrads there. From a graduate perspective, uh, the list of dissertation topics is endless. Just one example I thought of is, uh, we've got to question the use of music in documentary films. Uh, documentarist Richard Leacock, for instance, was the, uh, he had some real opinions on this and he didn't like music in films at all. But very, I, I, to my knowledge, nobody has approached this element of film studies before. Uh, because we have extensive notes within our fields that are keyed to music, and you know I got a music background, it was important to me, uh, this is an example of a dissertation that could potentially be put together. And so, you know, and the third thing is there is an argument for eventually looking into the possibility of putting together a, uh, a media archiving studies track uh, or person within JHU you now have a major film archive. So that's something I would look at in the future in terms of something worthy of further exploration. Thank you very much. Um, so I think what I would like to do now is open the Q&A portion of the program. I encourage people to ask questions through the Hopkins at Home Watch Now chat, and we'll do our best to respond to as many questions as we can in the time that's available. And I notice we have some questions that have come in already. So um, from Bill, do any of the films require restoration? I can answer that, yes. And then... <laughs> <laughs> They're in the freezer right now. And then um, for Jeff, what is the oldest or earliest film in the collection? I, I will tell you one of the earliest because we just digitized it. It's a rare film showing uh, the ballet set that Giacomo Bala did for a Nijinsky ballet in the early 1900s. It's the only known footage available of this. Uh, Coincidentally, it probably requires a little bit of, uh, of uh, restoration, even though we brought back the color. We think the film is dated about 1918, but I'm not completely sure. Uh, more research has to be done on it. We simply don't know. It came from the private collection of the choreographer. Oh, wow. That sounds amazing. So Yeah, it's uh, a pretty hot film. So the... the um... So when you had these films and started doing some of the restoration work, um, what normally happens during restoration? We don't do restoration because it's really a scientific, uh, okay. it's really a scientific system. What we do is we preserve. So the way we okay. preserve a film is we repair some sprocket damage. We put films in the freezer and uh, we talked about the freezer. Uh, one of the things that 16 millimeter film is susceptible to is something called the vinegar syndrome, which uh, results from molecules moving around, uh, activated by temp high temperature and high humidity. The film starts smelling of vinegar and it starts falling apart. Uh, the, the, the emulsion literally comes across from the base, comes apart from the base. We put those in the freezer and we put in something called a molecular sieve made by Eastman, and that uh, stops the uh, process of degradation. Uh, it's going to be up to other forces to do what I would call a good job of restoration on these films, which is quite extensive and quite expensive. The most important thing, therefore, from my perspective is 
keep them in a situation where they are ultimately going to be uh, good candidates for restoration. And, and I will say our library services center has the ideal temperature and humidity for keeping them in that kind of good con condition. So um, from, from Renee Fisher, she says, thanks for the nod at the top of the hour, Jeff. I loved working on the montage and seeing so many of these treasures. I know it's an impossible question, but what are some of your favorite films in the collection? And I was going to ask you that too. So thanks, Renee, for, for putting that question in. Um, it's like asking who your favorite kid is. Uh, it's impossible, but we have so many success stories. I'll tell you one of them really fast because th this is why you can't choose just one. We've championed the Physical Science Study Committee, committee films from 1960. These were a series of uh, roughly 100 physics films that were made in uh, roughly 1960 through 62. Uh, we have done a lot of historical work on these films. We have put up most of them on the Internet Archive. And because physics doesn't change a whole lot, they're still being used as teaching tools by uh, teachers all over the world. We get emails from many different countries saying, thank you for putting this up. I saw this when I was a kid. This is perfect for my students. And this is why I can't choose a favorite because I got a different good story every day. Oh, that's great. So the next question is, I Wu asks, with the recent Oscars Asian buzz countering anti-Asian hate, what films, if any, pertain to or show Asian American experiences? We've got so many that an Asian scholar came in last year and interviewed us on some of the films we had relating to the Asian American experience. Uh, one of my favorites is Sue Mei Wong, Who Shall I Be? It was made by Learning Corporation of America in the mid 1970s. In the 1970s, Learning Corporation of America which was run by Bill Deneen, uh, wanted to open up educational film to different ethnicities within the United States. Back in the 1950s, uh, film companies were making educational films in the United States, and when they showed a classroom, they would pro forma block out students who weren't white because Southern school districts wouldn't buy the films. By the 1970s, that began changing and Learning Corporation of America was one of the companies that did this. They made a number of films, I would say perhaps two dozen films, not only on the Asian American experience, but on the Chicano American experience, the Black American experience, Alaskan Eskimos, Hawaiians, uh, I should use the word Inuit. Uh, but that's that's why it occurred. And so we have always really focused on the ethnic American experience and films that reflect that from an educational perspective. So the answer is we have a lot. That's great. And thank you for the question. Um, from Lori, are there plans to work with the MA Museum Studies program? They do a lot with media preservation and digital curation. So maybe maybe Don. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned that, Lori. Um, certainly, we do a lot of work to support the Masters in Museum Studies program, uh, and you're talking to the one the one that's in the Advanced Academic Programs in Krieger, I believe. Um, that would be a fantastic idea for us to reach out to them. Uh, they do uh, the the people in those programs are acting professionals uh, as a rule and have great experience. So thanks for mentioning that. I think it's something we should definitely pursue. And then we also have uh, in the Krieger School of the Museums and Society program, uh, which is an undergraduate program. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, I, I'll certainly reach out to the faculty there too, to see um, if they're interested in this kind of thing. So, um, so thanks, Lori, for that suggestion. Yeah, always looking for new opportunities. Yeah, I think a lot's gonna gonna start happening once we get everything ingested and discoverable, and then really can figure out a way how to how to really make these work with uh, uh, teaching and learning here at Hopkins. So, um, like Don and I, Don said, we're still at that engagement stage. There's still a lot more work to be done um, but before we can make these as useful and usable as possible. Right. So. And 
Well, the other thing I wanted to add is that there are people in PhD programs on campus too that uh, that are interested interested in film as historic media. So uh, hopeful, ho we're hopeful that some of those connections will help us too. Yeah, I think there's a lot of applications when one sits back and, and starts uh, digging into this. So another question we have, Heather asked Jeff, have you seen a change in film libraries for appreciating these films since you started collecting them? And are you continuing to add to the archive now that it's at Hopkins? And, and she, the, Heather also says, we can expand that to Liz and Don about in what are the ways have libraries expanded collections similar to this? So we'll come around to that after, after Jeff. Yeah, there's been a huge change. But back when we first started working with these films, uh, Rick Prellinger was, was another film archivist who's very well known, who had worked a lot with films that were made prior to 1960. That was Rick's field of expertise. Uh, ours are mostly post Sputnik films. And the reason is, is because when Sputnik came around, the United States started kicking millions of dollars into film companies to make these kinds of films. They're a little bit updated and they're more modern. Uh, when I first wrote my book, my first book, films, these film libraries were being deaccessioned all over the United States. Very few people thought they had any value, including many media archivists. That's changed. Uh, not only do we have my books and Rick's books on film, but other people are writing books on academic films now. Uh, I'm not aware of any media library that's thrown away a 16 millimeter film in the past five years. So I would say things have changed. Uh, what are we gonna continue to do to work with Johns Hopkins? The Academic Film Archive of North America is not going away. Uh, we, will maintain, we will maintain our research facilities and our website, which we think is an important historical uh, reason for documenting these films. The difference now is that when we take films in, we will document and do the research. And then once we're done with them, we'll ship them to Johns Hopkins to join the rest of their films in the library. So essentially we will operate as a, uh, as a research facility within the greater scheme of things within the, the collection that now exists at Johns Hopkins. Don, would you like to add anything to that? Or on um, how do we ex the the question says, in what ways have libraries expanded collections in ways similar to this? Well, I think um, I think there's a, a growing fascination among students with uh, sort of historic media. Um, that concept, for example, for musical recordings, now people are buying LPs all over the place. Uh, there is this sort of, even if it's sort of a charming retrospective uh, thought about it, but I, that strikes me as a, a big um uh, a big need that's emerging among the students that not only are they uh, being taught by the faculty about film as a physical medium, um, they are fascinated by it. Um, and I, I think this is just going to continue to grow. So, um, so the implications, of course, is we have to really figure out how to you know, to, to service them properly, which we're already working on. And we've all talked about that. So I don't know if that addresses the question per se, but it might be a bit of a tangent. Um, but I think, I think students are really, really interested in this. I mean, I think we're always looking to grow our collections in ways that support the scholarship that's happening on campus, um, whether it's through through films or, or other kinds of content, books, archives, um, that's, that's what we do. We, we build collections and, and we're excited about that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and, absolutely. Would, I would, yeah, that was one, something I said earlier, too, is that it's our job to make sure that we we have the materials that our researchers need, uh, no matter what they are, uh, to the best of our ability. Yeah, so I think one thing, too, that we haven't really touched about uh, on this, and, and this is a question for both Jeff and, and Don, is could you talk a little bit about some of the ephemera that came with this collection, too? We've talked a lot about the films, but there was also a great deal of, of other materials that came with this collection. Um, so, Jeff, do you want to start on that one? Yeah, we have made... Um a real forceful attempt to collect the history of this film movement in print. 
Uh, we've collected thousands of study guides that teachers used to use films to teach in the classroom. Uh, we've collected uh, books relating to foreign language instruction films, which we think are very important. Uh, we've got a number of those from the early 1960s, the Je Paul Francais series. We're able to collect some of the rare books from those uh, that were used in the classroom. We've got photographs. We have personal collections of uh, the Warren Everett collection, for instance. He was the president of Encyclopedia Britannica films for a while. We got his entire uh, archive, which now exists at Johns Hopkins University and is worthy of further study. Yeah, and I'd like to add that when there are scholars who are who are researching film, um, they're always interested in the ephemeral ephemeral materials surrounding the film. They are always interested in in that material and also the historical context and um, the the role that the film and its ephemera played in uh, in that moment in time. So that's that's the nature of of scholarship, and I think that's one of the one of the wonderful things that uh, that bring that this collection brings to our campus. So we have two remaining questions in our last few minutes. So um, the first one is: Are these films considered public domain or in kind of a Creative Commons license, or are there copyright concerns about adding uh, digitizing and adding them to the internet? Uh, some of the films are in public domain. Most of them are not. Most of them are under copyright. We know who the copyright owners are. Let me explain how we work with copyright owners to digitize films and provide public access. So, for instance, with Encyclopedia Britannica, we cooked up an arrangement with them where they allowed us to digitize certain films, put them up on the Internet Archive in a lower resolution than broadcast quality, but still perfectly okay to watch at home. If people want to make use, commercial use of that footage, then they go to Getty Images and they license the footage from Encyclopedia Britannica through Getty Images. We have arrangements with a number of different copyright holders like this. And as I explained to the copyright holders, we're a free marketing arm for them. If people don't see these films, no one's gonna wanna use the footage and therefore they can't make money. So that's the way we get around the copyright law. So I have a good relationship with a lot of the copyright holders and many of these, by the way, are private individuals, filmmakers, who are just delighted to see their films up and delighted to have people watch them. And if somebody makes commercial use of the footage, the filmmaker wins. So um, that's a, a really good explanation of how the copyright business works with this film collection. Great, thank you. Um, so the, the last question that we have in the queue is, um, and it's, I have a very good question, and I'm not sure we're going to have a very good answer for it, but um, how can members of the Hopkins community and the public at large view films from the archive? Um, now, there's about 400 that are already on Internet Archive that are up and free and ready for people to use. The remaining parts of the collection, we still have not fully processed them yet, and we are not um, fully ready to service them out. They're, they're not going to be something that you can necessarily check out and take home. You know, more than likely, most people don't have 16 millimeter projectors. I'm hoping that over time we can really um, start figuring out how to do, um, you know, uh, definitely little film series and be able to start showing these more frequently. But um, right now, it's, they're, they're not necessarily going to be, you can come in, check them out and take them someplace. Don, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? Yeah, I did want to add the, that concept where, you know, we're just not ready yet to make sure that the films themselves can be used safely. And um, like I said, we've taken an inventory of our equipment, but what we haven't done yet is have it examined to make sure the equipment is sound and is working properly and will not damage the materials when used. So that's what, where I'm working with the faculty members in film and media to assess that. Also looking at their, their equipment and managing the materials um, 
by a, someone who's skilled in using 16 millimeter. If we will treat this like special collections material, these are rare items. Uh, just like if we pull if we pull a six, 16th century early printed book, you have to come to the reading room. We have to open it for you, put it in a in a cradle, and turn the pages delicately. We're trying to figure all that process out now. Uh, and this goes back to the you know the engagement party part. Uh, we are thinking ahead to how are we going to make that happen? And it's, it's we don't know yet, um, but we have to treat these things as, um, as delicate objects. Uh, they, uh, we have to do it for the integrity, for the long-term integrity. That's the priority of a research library, I believe. Um, so the idea, I believe someone mentioned something about doing art house uh, uh, film uh, series with local film, um, uh, places like the Charles or the Senator, um, that still is would would have to be pretty far off. Um, but it could be a, a, the result of a project uh, that would be a collaboration, and that's something exciting uh, that we should look for. But again, for the future, um, one of the things that worries me about uh, talking too much about this great collection is that it gets people excited and they want it now, uh, and we're not ready. <laughs> you know, we're not ready, and. Um, and because mostly because of some of the things, these are the, you know, I'm a librarian, I worry about these things. You know, I, I want the material to last forever. So we have to figure out how to how to protect material when when while we're figuring out the modes of access. Yeah. And things also we have to think about is like how digitization stand, you know, standards, how or, or requests. Maybe we can figure out some way to prioritize digitization of things based on requests and use requests for yeah, use. I think what, what Dan's saying is that we're still at the very early stages. Getting a collection like this, as exciting as it is, is a long-term project. And we are at the at the very beginning. I'm so excited though to see so many interesting questions about people wanting to explore this really amazing collection. And now I see it looks like we're we're out of time. We'd like to thank our panelists um, and, and, and attendees for joining us this evening. Um, a really definite um, special thanks to Jeff and his generous donation of this amazing collection and just the amazing stories you always tell. Um, every, every, every conversation is an adventure. So um, a follow-up email will be shared with you that will include the recording of the program and a link to our upcoming event schedule. We hope to see you soon at further future Sheridan Library events, and you can always find and register for upcoming programs at events.jhu.edu. We hope everyone has a great evening and very much appreciate you coming out tonight. So good evening. You can go get your glass of wine now. <laughs>